Kim by Rudyard Kipling. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Kim by Rudyard Kipling. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter 13, Part 1. Who hath desired the sea, the immense, contemptuous surges? The shudder, the stumble, the swerve, ere the star-stabbing bowsprit emerges. The orderly clouds of the trades, and the ridged, roaring sapphire thereunder. Unheralded cliff-lurking floors, and the headsails, low-volleying thunder. His sea in no wonder the same, his sea and the same in each wonder. His sea that his being fulfils? So and no otherwise, so and no otherwise, hillmen desire their hills. The Sea and the Hills Who goes to the hills goes to his mother. They had crossed the Siwaliks and the half-tropical dune, left Masuri behind them, and headed north along the narrow hill-roads. Day after day they struck deeper into the huddled mountains, and day after day Kim watched the lama return to a man's strength. Among the terraces of the dune he had leaned on the boy's shoulder, ready to profit by wayside halts. Under the great ramp to Masuri he drew himself altogether as an old hunter faces a well-remembered bank, and where he should have sunk exhausted swung his long draperies about him, drew a deep double lungful of the diamond air, and walked as only a hillman can. Kim, plains bred and plains fed, sweated and panted, astonished. "'This is my country,' said the lama. "'Besides Sudsen, this is flatter than a rice-field.' and with steady, driving strokes from the loins he strode upwards. But it was on the steep downhill marches, three thousand feet in three hours, that he went utterly away from Kim, whose back arched with holding back, and whose big toe was nigh cut off by his grass sandal-string. Through the speckled shadow of the great deodar forests, through oak feathered and plumed with ferns, birch, Ilex, rhododendron, and pine, out on the bare hillside slippery sunburnt grass, and back into the woodlands coolth again, till oak gave way to bamboo and palm of the valley, the lama swung untiring. Glancing back in the twilight at the huge ridges behind him, and the faint thin line of the road whereby they had come, he would lay out with a hillman's generous breadth of vision fresh marches for the morrow, or, halting in the neck of some uplifted pass that gave on Spiti and Kulu, would stretch out his hands yearningly towards the high snows of the horizon. In the dawns they flared windy red above stark blue, as Kedarnath and Badrinath, kings of that wilderness, took the first sunlight. All day long they lay like molten silver under the sun, and at evening put on their jewels again. At first they breathed temperately upon the travellers, winds good to meet when one crawled over some gigantic hog's back. But in a few days, at a height of nine or ten thousand feet, those breezes bit. And Kim kindly allowed a village of hillmen to acquire merit by giving him a rough blanket-coat. The lama was mildly surprised that any one should object to the knife-edged breezes which had cut the years off his shoulders. "'These are but the lower hills, Chela. There is no cold till we come to the true hills. Air and water are good, and the people are devout enough, but the food is very bad,' Kim growled. "'And we walk as though we were mad, or English.' It freezes at night, too. A little, maybe, but only enough to make old bones rejoice in the sun. We must not always delight in soft beds and rich food. We might at least 
keep to the road. Kim had all a plainsman's affection for the well-trodden track, not six feet wide, that snaked among the mountains, but the lama, being Tibetan, could not refrain from shortcuts over spurs and the rims of gravel-strewn slopes. As he explained to his limping disciple, a man bred among mountains can prophesy the course of a mountain road, and though low-lying clouds might be a hindrance to a short-cutting stranger, they made no earthly difference to a thoughtful man. Thus, after long hours of what would be reckoned very fair mountaineering in civilized countries, they would pant over a saddleback, sidle past a few landslips, and drop through forest at an angle of forty-five onto the road again. Along their track lay the villages of the hill folk, mud and earth huts, timbers now and then rudely carved with an axe, clinging like swallows' nests against the steeps huddled on tiny flats halfway down a three-thousand-foot glissade, jammed into a corner between cliffs that funnelled and focused every wandering blast, or, for the sake of summer pasture, cowering down on a neck that in winter would be ten feet deep in snow. And the people, the sallow, greasy, duffel-clad people, with short, bare legs and faces almost esquimo, would flock out and adore. The plains, kindly and gentle, had treated the lama as a holy man among holy men. But the hills worshipped him as one in the confidence of all their devils. Theirs was an almost obliterated Buddhism, overlaid with a nature-worship fantastic as their own landscapes, elaborate as the terracing of their tiny fields but they recognized the big hat, the clicking rosary, and the rare Chinese texts for great authority, and they respected the man beneath the hat. "'We see thee come down over the black breasts of you are,' said a betar who gave them cheese, sour milk, and stone-hard bread one evening. "'We do not use that often, except when carving cows stray in summer.' There is a summer wind amongst those stones that casts men down on the stillest day. But what should such folk care for the devil of you are? Then did Kim, aching in every fibre, dizzy with looking down, footsore with cramping desperate toes in inadequate crannies, take joy in the day's march. Such joy as a boy of St. Xavier's, who had won the quarter-mile on the flat, might take in the praises of his friends. The hills sweated the gee and sugar-suet off his bones. The dry air, taken sobbingly at the head of cruel passes, firmed and built out his upper ribs, and the tilted levels put new hard muscles into calf and thigh. They meditated often on the wheel of life, the more so since, as the lama said, they were freed from its visible temptations. Except the grey eagle and an occasional far-seen bear grubbing and rooting on the hillside, a vision of a furious painted leopard met at dawn in a still valley devouring a goat, and now and again a bright-coloured bird, they were alone with the winds and the grass singing under the wind. The women of the smoky huts over whose roofs the two walked as they descended the mountains were unlovely and unclean, wives of many husbands and afflicted with goiter. The men were woodcutters when they were not farmers, meek and of an incredible simplicity. But that suitable discourse might not fail, fate sent them, overtaking and overtaken on the road, the courteous Dakar physician who paid for his food in ointments good for goitre and counsels that restore peace between men and women. He seemed to know these hills as well as he knew the hill dialects, and gave the lama the lie of the land towards Ladek and Tibet. He said they could return to the plains at any moment. Meanwhile, for such as loved mountains, yonder road might amuse. This was not at all revealed in a breath, but at evening encounters on the stone threshing floors, when, patients disposed of, the doctor would smoke, and the lama snuff, 
while Kim watched the wee cows grazing on the housetops, or threw his soul after his eye across the deep blue gulfs between range and range. And there were talks apart in the dark woods, when the doctor would seek herbs, and Kim, as a budding physician, must accompany him. "'You see, Mr. O'Hara, I do not know what the deuce and all I shall do when I find our sporting friends, but if you will kindly keep within sight of my umbrella, which is a fine fixed point for cadastral survey, I shall feel much better.' Kim looked out across the jungle of peaks. "'This is not my country, Hakim. Easier, I think, to find one louse in a bearskin. Oh, that is my strong points. There is no hurry for hurry. They were at Le not so long ago. They said they had come down from the Karakarum with their heads and horns and all. I am only afraid they will have sent back all their letters and compromising things from Le into Russian territory. Of course, they will walk away as far to the east as possible, just to show that they were never among the western states. You do not know the hills? He scratched with a twig on the earth. Look, they should have come in by Serinagar or Abbottabad. That is their short road. Down the river by Banji and Astor. But they have made mischief in the west, so— He drew a furrow from left to right. They march, and they march away east to Le. Ah, it is cold there, and down the Indus to Hanle. I know that road. And then down, you see, to Bushahar and Chini Valley. That is ascertained by process of elimination, and also by asking questions from people that I cure so well. Our friends have been a long time playing about and producing impressions, so they are well known from far off. You will see me catch them somewhere in Chini Valley. Please keep your eye on the umbrella. It nodded like a wind-blown harebell down the valleys and round the mountain sides, and in due time the Lama and Kim, who steered by compass, would overhaul it, vending ointments and powders at eventide. We came by such and such a way. The lama would throw a careless finger backward at the ridges, and the umbrella would expand itself in compliments. They crossed the snowy pass in cold moonlight, when the lama, mildly chaffing Kim, went through up to his knees like a Bactrian camel, the snow-bred, shag-haired sort that come into the Kashmir Sarai. They dipped across beds of light snow and snow-powdered shale where they took refuge from a gale in a camp of Tibetans hurrying down tiny sheep, each laden with a bag of borax. They came out upon grassy shoulders, still snow-speckled, and through forest to grass anew. For all their marchings, Kedarnath and Badrinath were not impressed, and it was only after days of travel that Kim, uplifted upon some insignificant ten-thousand-foot hummock, could see that a shoulder-knot or horn of the two great lords had, ever so slightly, changed outline. At last they entered a world within a world, a valley of leagues where the high hills were fashioned of the mere rubble and refuse from off the knees of the mountains. Here one day's march carried them no farther. It seemed that a dreamer's clogged pace bears him in a nightmare. They skirted a shoulder painfully for hours, and, behold, it was but an outlying boss in an outlying buttress of the main pile. A rounded meadow revealed itself when they had reached it for a vast tableland running far into the valley. Three days later it was a dim fold in the earth to the southward. "'Surely the gods live here,' said Kim, beaten down by the silence and the appalling sweep and dispersal of the cloud-shadows after rain. "'This is no place for men.' "'Long and long ago,' said the lama, as to himself, "'it was asked of the Lord whether the world were everlasting.' 
to this the Excellent One returned no answer. When I was in Ceylon, a wise seeker confirmed that from the Gospel which is written in Pali. Certainly, since we know the way to freedom, the question were unprofitable. But look, and no illusion, Chela. These are the true hills. They are like my hills by Sutsen. Never were such hills. Above them, still enormously above them, earth towered away towards the snow line, where from east to west, across hundreds of miles, ruled as with a ruler, the last of the bold birches stopped. Above that, in scarps and blocks upheaved, the rocks strove to fight their heads above the white smother. Above these again, changeless since the world's beginning, but changing to every mood of sun and cloud, lay out the eternal snow. They could see blots and blurs on its face where storm and wandering Wooliwa got up to dance. Below them, as they stood, the forest slid away in a sheet of blue-green for mile upon mile. Below the forest was a village in its sprinkle of terraced fields and steep grazing grounds. Below the village they knew, through a thunderstorm worried and growled there for the moment, a pitch of twelve or fifteen hundred feet gave to the moist valley where the streams gather that are the mothers of young Sutluj. As usual, the lama had led Kim by cow-track and by-road, far from the main route along which Hari Babu, that fearful man, had bucketed three days before through a storm to which nine Englishmen out of ten would have given full right of way. Hari was no game-shot. The snick of a trigger made him change colour, but, as he himself would have said, he was fairly efficient stalker and he had raked the huge valley with a pair of cheap binoculars to some purpose. Moreover, the white of worn canvas tents against green carries far. Hari Babu had seen all he wanted to see when he sat on the threshing floor of Ziglau, twenty miles away as the eagle flies, and forty by road, that is to say, two small dots, which one day were just below the snow line, and the next had moved downwards, perhaps six inches, on the hillside. Once cleaned out and set to the work, his fat bare legs could cover a surprising amount of ground, and this was the reason why, while Kim and the Lama lay in a leaky hut at Ziglau till the storm should be overpassed, an oily, wet, but always smiling Bengali, talking the best of English with the vilest of phrases, was ingratiating himself with two sodden and rather rheumatic foreigners. He had arrived, revolving many wild schemes, on the heels of a thunderstorm which had split a pine over against their camp, and so convinced a dozen or two forcibly impressed baggage coolies the day was inauspicious for further travel that, with one accord, they had thrown down their loads and jibbed. They were subjects of a hill-rajah who farmed out their services, as is the custom, for his private gain. And, to add to their personal distresses, the strange sahibs had already threatened them with rifles. The most of them knew rifles and sahibs of old. They were trackers and shikaris of the northern valleys, keen after bear and wild goat, but they had never been thus treated in their lives. So the forest took them to her bosom, and, for all oaths and clamour, refused to restore. There was no need to feign madness, or the Babu had thought of another means of securing a welcome. He wrung out his wet clothes, slipped on his patent leather shoes, opened the blue and white umbrella, and with mincing gait and a heart beating against his tonsils, appeared as agent for his royal highness, the Raja of Rampur, gentlemen. What can I do for you, please? The gentlemen were delighted. One was visibly French, the other Russian, but they spoke English not much inferior to the Babus. 
they begged his kind offices. Their native servants had gone sick at Le. They had hurried on because they were anxious to bring the spoils of the chase to Simla ere the skins grew moth-eaten. They bore a general letter of introduction, the Babu salaamed to it orientally, to all government officials. No, they had not met any other shooting parties en route. They did for themselves. They had plenty of supplies. They only wished to push on as soon as might be. At this he waylaid a cowering hillman among the trees, and, after three minutes' talk and a little silver, one cannot be economical upon state service, though Hurry's heart bled at the waste, the eleven coolies and the three hangers-on reappeared. At least the Babu would be a witness to their oppression. "'My royal master, he will be much annoyed, but these people are only common people, and grossly ignorant. If your honours will kindly overlook unfortunate affair, I shall be much pleased. In a little while rain will stop, and we can then proceed. You have been shooting, eh? That is fine performance.' He skipped nimbly from one kilter to the next, making pretense to adjust each conical basket. The Englishman is not, as a rule, familiar with the Asiatic, but he would not strike across the wrist a kindly babu who accidentally upset a kilter with a red oilskin top. On the other hand, he would not press drink upon a babu were he never so friendly, nor would he invite him to meet. The strangers did all these things, and asked many questions—about women, mostly—to which Hurry returned gay and unstudied answers. They gave him a glass of whitish fluid like to gin, and then more, and in a little time his gravity departed from him. He became thickly treasonous, and spoke in terms of sweeping indecency of a government which had forced upon him a white man's education and neglected to supply him with a white man's salary. He babbled tales of oppression and wrongs, till the tears ran down his cheeks for the miseries of his land. Then he staggered off, singing love-songs of Lower Bengal, and collapsed upon a wet tree-trunk. Never was so unfortunate a product of English rule in India more unhappily thrust upon aliens. They are all just of that pattern said one sportsman to the other in French. "'When we get into India proper, thou wilt see. I should like to visit his Raja. One might speak the good word there. It is possible that he has heard of us, and wishes to signify his good will. "'We have not time. We must get into Simla as soon as may be,' his companion replied. "'For my own part, I wish our reports had been sent back from Hilas, or even Le. The English post is better and safer. Remember, we are given all facilities, and name of God, they gave them to us too. Is it unbelievable stupidity? It is pride, pride that deserves and will receive punishment. Yes, to fight a fellow continental in our game is something. There is risk attached. But these people, bah, it is too easy. Pride. All pride, my friend. Now, what the deuce is good of Chandanagur being so close to Calcutta and all? said Hari, snoring open mouthed on the sodden moss. If I cannot understand their French, they talk so particularly fast, it would have been much better to cut their beastly throats. When he presented himself again, he was racked with a headache, penitent and volubly afraid that in his drunkenness he might have been indiscreet. He loved the British government. It was the source of all prosperity and honour, and his master at Rampur held the very same opinion. Upon this the men began to deride him, and to quote past words, till, step by step, with depreciating smirks, oily grins, and leers of infinite cunning, the poor Babu was beaten out of his defences, and forced to speak truth. When Lurigan was told the tale later, he mourned aloud that he could not have been in the place of the stubborn, inattentive coolies, 
who, with grass mats over their heads and the raindrops puddling in their footsteps, waited on the weather. All the Sahibs of their acquaintance, rough-clad men joyously returning year after year to their chosen gullies, had servants and cooks and orderlies, very often hillmen. These Sahibs travelled without any retinue. Therefore they were poor Sahibs and ignorant, for no Sahib in his senses would follow a Bengali's advice. But the Bengali, appearing from somewhere, had given them money, and could make shift with their dialect. Used to comprehensive ill-treatment from their own colour, they suspected a trap somewhere, and stood by to run if occasion offered. Then, through the new-washed air, steaming with delicious earth smells, the Babu led the way down the slopes, walking ahead of the coolies in pride, walking behind the foreigners in humility. His thoughts were many and various. The least of them would have interested his companions beyond words. But he was an agreeable guide, ever keen to point out the beauties of his royal master's domain. He peopled the hills with anything they had a mind to slay, Thar, Ibex, or Makur, and Bear, by Alicia's allowance. He discoursed of botany and ethnology with unimpeachable inaccuracy, and his store of local legends—he had been a trusted agent of the State for fifteen years, remember—was inexhaustible. "'Decidedly this fellow is an original,' said the taller of the two foreigners. "'He is like the nightmare of a Viennese courier. "'He represents in Little India in transition, "'the monstrous hybridism of East and West,' the Russian replied. "'It is we who can deal with Orientals.' "'He has lost his own country, and has not acquired any other. "'But he has a most complete hatred of his conquerors. "'Listen, he confided to me last night,' said the other. Under the striped umbrella, Hari Babu was straining ear and brain to follow the quick-pawed French, and keeping both eyes on a kilter full of maps and documents, an over-large one with a double red oilskin cover. He did not wish to steal anything. He only desired to know what to steal, and, incidentally, how to get away when he had stolen it. He thanked all the gods of Hindustan and Herbert Spencer, that there remained some valuables to steal. End of chapter 13, part 1《Kim》by Rudyard Kipling This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — Kim by Rudyard Kipling, read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter 13, Part 2 On the second day the road rose steeply to a grass spur above the forest, and it was here, about sunset, that they came across an aged lama, but they called him a bonze, sitting cross-legged above a mysterious chart held down by stones, which he was explaining to a young man evidently a neophyte, of singular though unwashen beauty. The striped umbrella had been sighted half a march away, and Kim had suggested a halt till it came up to them. "'Ha!' said Hari Babu, resourceful as puss in boots. "'That is eminent local holy man, probably subject of my royal master.' "'What is he doing? It is very curious.' "'He is expounding holy picture, all hand-worked. The two men stood bareheaded in the wash of the afternoon sunlight, low across the gold-coloured grass. The sullen coolies, glad of the check, halted and slid down their loads. "'Look,' said the Frenchman, "'it is like a picture for the birth of a religion, the first teacher and the first a disciple. Is he a Buddhist?' "'Of some debased kind.' the other asked. There are no true Buddhists among the hills. But look at the folds of his drapery. Look at his eyes. How insolent! Why does this make one feel that we are so young a people?" The speaker struck passionately at a tall weed. 
We have nowhere left our mark yet. Nowhere. That, do you understand, is what disquiets me. He scowled at the placid face and the monumental calm of the pose. Have patience. We shall make your mark together, we and you young people. Meantime, draw his picture. The Babu advanced loftily, his back out of all keeping with his deferential speech or his wink towards Kim. Holy One, these be Sahibs. My medicines cured one of a flux, and I go into Simla to oversee his recovery. They wish to see thy picture. To heal the sick is always good. This is the wheel of life, said the Lama. The same I showed thee in the hut at Zigla when the rain fell. And to hear thee expound it. The Lama's eyes lightened at the prospect of new listeners. To expound the most excellent way is good. Have they any knowledge of Hindi, such as had the keeper of images? A little, maybe. Hereat, simply as a child engrossed with a new game, the Lama threw back his head and began the full-throated invocation of the Doctor of Divinity ere he opens the full doctrine. The strangers leaned on their alpenstocks and listened. Kim, squatting humbly, watched the red sunlight on their faces and the blend and parting of their long shadows. They wore un-English leggings and curious girt-in belts that reminded him hazily of the pictures in a book at St. Xavier's Library. The Adventures of a Young Naturalist in Mexico was its name. Yes, they looked very like the wonderful M. Summicrast of that tale, and very unlike the highly unscrupulous folk of Hari Babu's imaging. The coolies, earth-coloured and mute, crouched reverently some twenty or thirty yards away, and the babu, the slack of his thin gear snapping like a marking flag in the chill breeze, stood by with an air of happy proprietorship. "'These are the men,' Hari whispered as the ritual went on, and the two whites followed the grass-blade sweeping from hell to heaven and back again. All their books are in the large kilter with the red top. Books and reports and maps. And I have seen a king's letter that either Hillas or Buna has written. They guard it most carefully. They have sent nothing back from Hillas or Leh. That is sure. Who is with them? Only the Bigar coolies. They have no servants. They are so close they cook their own food. But what am I to do? Wait and see. If any chance comes to me, thou wilt know where to seek for the papers. This were better in Mahbub Ali's hands than a Bengali's, said Kim scornfully. There are more ways of getting to a sweetheart than butting down a wall. See here, the hell appointed for avarice and greed, flanked upon the one side by desire and on the other by weariness. The Lama warmed to his work, and one of the strangers sketched him in the quick fading light. That is enough, the man said at last, brusquely. I cannot understand him, but I want that picture. He is a better artist than I. Ask him if he will sell it. He says, No, sir, the Babu replied. The Lama, of course, would no more have parted with his chart to a casual wayfarer than an archbishop would pawn the holy vessels of the cathedral. All Tibet is full of cheap reproductions of the wheel, but the Lama was an artist, as well as a wealthy abbot in his own place. "'Perhaps in three days, or four, or ten, if I perceive that the Sahib is a seeker, and of good understanding, I may myself draw him another. But this was used for the initiation of a novice. Tell him so, Hakim. He wishes it now for money. The Lama shook his head slowly and began to fold up the wheel. 
The Russian, on his side, saw no more than an unclean old man haggling over a dirty piece of paper. He drew out a handful of rupees and snatched half-jestingly at the chart which tore in the lama's grip. A low murmur of horror went up from the coolies, some of whom were speedy men and, by their lights, good Buddhists. The lama rose at the insult. His hand went to the heavy iron pen-case, that is, the priest's weapon, and the babu danced in agony. "'No, you see! You see why I wanted witnesses! These are highly unscrupulous people! Oh, sir, sir, you must not hit holy man!' Jela, he has defiled the written word. It was too late. Before Kim could ward him off, the Russian struck the old man full on the face. Next instant he was rolling over and over downhill with Kim at his throat. The blow had waked every unknown Irish devil in the boy's blood, and the sudden fall of his enemy did the rest. The lama dropped to his knees, half stunned. The coolies, under their loads, fled up the hill as fast as plainsmen ran across the level. They had seen sacrilege unspeakable, and it behooved them to get away before the gods and devils of the hills took vengeance. The Frenchman ran towards the lama, fumbling at his revolver with some notion of making him a hostage for his companion. A shower of cutting stones—hillmen are very straight shots— drove him away, and a coolie from O Chung snatched the lama into the stampede. All came about as swiftly as the sudden mountain darkness. "'They have taken the baggage and all of the guns!' yelled the Frenchman, firing blindly into the twilight. "'All right, sir, all right, don't shoot! I go to rescue!' said Hurry, pounding down the slope, cast himself bodily upon the delighted and astonished Kim who was banging his breathless foe's head against the boulder. "'Go back to the coolies,' whispered the babu in his ear. "'They have the baggage. The papers are in the kilter with the red top. But look through all. Take their papers, and specially the Murasla, King's letter. Go! The other man comes!' Kim tore uphill. A revolver bullet rang on a rock by his side, and he cowered partridge-wise. "'If you shoot—' shouted Hurry. "'They will descend and annihilate us. I have rescued the gentleman, sir. This is particularly dangerous.' "'By Jove!' Kim was thinking hard in English. "'This is damn tight place, but I think it is self-defence. He felt in his bosom for Mahbub's gift, and uncertainly, save for a few practice shots in the Bikanir desert he had never used the little gun, pulled trigger. "'What did I say, sir?' The babu seemed to be in tears. "'Come down here and assist to resuscitate. We are all up a tree, I tell you.' The shots ceased. There was a sound of stumbling feet, and Kim hurried upward through the gloom, swearing like a cat or a country-bred. "'Did they wound thee, Chela? called the lama above him. "'No. And thou?' He dived into a clump of stunted firs. "'Unhurt! Come away! We go with these folks to Shamle under the snow!' "'But not before we have done justice,' a voice cried. "'I have got the Sahib's guns, all four. Let us go down.' "'He struck the Holy One. We saw it. Our cattle will be barren. Our wives will cease to bear. The snows will slide upon us as we go home.' atop of all other oppression, too!" The little fir clump filled with clamouring coolies, panic-stricken, and in their terror capable of anything. The man from O Chung clicked the breech-bolt of his gun impatiently, and made as to go downhill. "'Wait a little, holy one. They cannot go far. Wait till I return,' said he. "'It is this person who has suffered wrong!' said the lama, his hand over his brow. "'For that very reason,' was the reply. "'If this person overlooks it, your hands are clean. Moreover, ye acquire merit by obedience.' "'Wait, and we will all go to Shamley together,' the man insisted. For a moment 
not just so long as it needs to stuff a cartridge into a breech-loader, the lama hesitated. Then he rose to his feet and laid a finger on the man's shoulder. "'Hast thou heard? I say there shall be no killing. I, who was abbot of Sutzen, is it any lust of thine to be reborn as a rat, or a snake under the eaves, a worm in the belly of the most mean beast? Is it thy wish to? The man from O Chung fell to his knees, for the voice boomed like a Tibetan devil gong. Ay, ay, cried the speedy men. Do not curse us, do not curse us. It was but his zeal, holy one. Put down the rifle, fool. Anger, evil on evil, there will be no killing. Let the priest haters go in bondage to their own acts. Just and sure is the wheel, swerving not the hair. They will be born many times in torment. His head drooped, and he leaned heavily on Kim's shoulder. I have come near to great evil, Chela, he whispered in that dead hush under the pines. I was tempted to loose the bullet, and truly in Tibet there would have been a heavy and a slow death for them. He struck me across the face upon the flesh. He slid to the ground breathing heavily, and Kim could hear the overdriven heart pump and check. "'Have they hurt him to the death?' said the O-Chung man, while the others stood mute. Kim knelt over the body in deadly fear. "'Nay!' he cried passionately. "'This is only a weakness.' Then he remembered that he was a white man, with a white man's camp fittings at his service. "'Open the kilters!' The sahibs may have a medicine. Oh, then I know it, said the Ochang man with a laugh. Not for five years was I Yanklin sahibs shikari without knowing that medicine. I too have tasted it. Behold! He drew from his breast a bottle of cheap whisky, such as is sold to explorers at Leh, and cleverly forced a little between the lama's teeth. So did I when Yanklin Sahib twisted his foot beyond Astor. Aha! I have already looked into their baskets, but we will make a fair division at Shamle. Give him a little more. It is good medicine. Feel his heart goes better now. Lay his head down and rub a little on his chest. If he had waited quietly while I accounted for the Sahibs, this would never have come. But perhaps the Sahibs may chase us here. Then it would not be wrong to shoot them with their own guns, eh? Huh? One is paid, I think, already, said Kim between his teeth. I kicked him in the groin as we went downhill. Would I had killed him? As well as to be brave when one does not live in Rampur, said one whose hut lay within a few miles of the Raja's rickety palace. When we get a bad name among the sahibs, none will employ us as shikaris any more. Oh, but these are not Angrisi sahibs, not merry-minded men like Fustum sahib or Yanklin sahib. They are foreigners. They cannot speak Angrisi as do sahibs. Here the lama coughed and sat up, groping for the rosary. There shall be no killing, he murmured. Just is the wheel, evil on evil. Nay, holy one, we are all here. The Ochang man timidly patted his feet. Except by thy order, no one shall be slain. Rest a while. We will make a little camp here, and later, as the moon rises, we go to Shamlech under the snow. After a blow, said a speedy man sententiously, it is best to sleep. There is, as it were, a dizziness at the back of my neck and a pinching in it. Let me lay my head on thy lap, Chela. I am an old man, but not free from passion. 
We must think of the cause of things. Give him a blanket. We dare not light a fire, lest the Sahibs see. Better get away to Shamleh. None will follow us to Shamleh. This was the nervous Rampur man. I have been Fustum Sahib Shikari, and I am Yanklin Sahib Shikari. I should have been with Yanklin Sahib now, but for this accursed Bigar, the corvée. Let two men watch below with their guns, lest the Sahibs do more foolishness. I shall not leave this holy one. They sat down a little apart from the lama, and, while listening a while, passed round a water-pipe, whose receiver was an old Day and Martin blacking-bottle. The glow of the red charcoal, as it went from hand to hand, lit up the narrow blinking eyes, the high Chinese cheekbones, and the bull-throats that melted away into the dark duffel-folds round their shoulders. They looked like kobolds from some magic mime, gnomes of the hills in conclave, and while they talked the voices of the snow-waters round them diminished one by one as the night-frost choked and clogged the runnels. "'How he stood up against us!' said a speedy man, admiring. "'I remember an old ibex out Lachterway that Dupont Saib missed on a shoulder-shot seven seasons back, standing up just like him. Dupont Saib was a good shakiri. "'Not as good as Yanklin Sahib. the old chung man took a pull at the whisky bottle and passed it over. "'Now hear me, unless any other man thinks he knows more.' The challenge was not taken up. "'We go to Shamla when the moon rises. There we will fairly divide the baggage between us. I am content with this new little rifle and all its cartridges.' "'Are the bears only bad on thy holding?' said the mate, sucking at his pipe. No, but musk-pods are worth six rupees apiece now, and thy women can have the canvas of the tents and some of the cooking gear. We will do all that at Shamlech before dawn. Then we all go our ways, remembering that we have never seen or taken service with these sahibs, who may indeed say we have stolen their baggage. That is well for thee, but what will our Raja say? Who is to tell him? These sahibs who cannot speak our talk, or the babu, who, for his own ends, gave us money? Will he lead an army against us? What evidence will remain? That we do not need we shall throw on Shamle Midden, where no man has yet set foot. Who is at Shamle this summer? The place was only a grazing centre of three or four huts. The woman of Shamle. She has no love for sahibs, as we know. The others can be pleased with little presents, and here is enough for us all. He patted the fat sides of the nearest basket. But, but, I have said they are not true sahibs. All their skins and heads were bought in the bazaar at Le. I know the marks. I showed them to ye last March. True, they were all bought skins and heads. Some had even the moth in them. That was a shrewd argument, and the O-Chang man knew his fellows. "'If the worst comes to the worst, I shall tell Yanklin Sahib, who is a man of merry mind, and he will laugh. We are not doing any wrong to any Sahibs whom we know. They are priest-beaters. They frightened us. We fled. Who knows where we dropped the baggage? Do you think Yanklin Sahib will permit down-country police to wander all over the hills, disturbing his game?' It is a far cry from Simla to Chini, and farther from Shamle to Shamle Midden. So be it, but I carry the big kilter, the basket with the red top that the sahibs pack themselves every morning. Thus it is proved, said the Shamle man adroitly, that they are sahibs of no account. Who ever heard of Fostum Sahib, or Yanklin Sahib, or even little Peel Sahib, that sits up at nights to shoot Saro? I say, who ever heard of these sahibs coming into the hills without a down-country cook and a bearer, and, and all manner of well-paid, high-handed, and oppressive folk in their tail? How can they make trouble? What of the kilter? Nothing. But it is full of the written word, books and papers in which they wrote, and strange instruments as of worship. Shamli Midden will take them all. True. But how if we insult the sahibs' gods thereby? 
I do not like to handle the written word in that fashion, and their brass idols are beyond my comprehension. It is no plunder for simple hill folk. The old man still sleeps. Hist! We will wake his chela. The Ochang man refreshed himself and swelled with the pride of leadership. We have here, he whispered, a kilta whose nature we do not know. But I do, said Kim cautiously. The lama drew breath in natural easy sleep, and Kim had been thinking of Hari's last words. As a player of the great game he was disposed just then to reverence the babu. It is a kilta with a red top full of very wonderful things not to be handled by fools. I said it, I said it, cried the bearer of that burden. Thinkest thou it will betray us? Not if it be given to me. I can draw out its magic. Otherwise it will do great harm. A priest always takes his share. Whisky was demoralizing the O Chung man. It is no matter to me, Kim answered, with the craft of his mother country. Share it among you, and see what comes. Not I. I was only jesting. Give the order. There is more than enough for us all. We go our way from Shamle in the dawn. They arranged and rearranged their artless little plans for another hour, while Kim shivered with cold and pride. The humour of the situation tickled the Irish and the Oriental in his soul. Here were the emissaries of the dread power of the North, very possibly as great in their own land as Mahbub or Colonel Crichton, suddenly smitten helpless. One of them, he privately knew, would be lame for a time. They had made promises to kings. Tonight they lay out somewhere below him, chartless, foodless, tentless, gunless, except for Hari Babu, guideless. And this collapse of their great game—Kim wondered to whom they would report it—this panicky bolt into the night had come about through no craft of Hari's or contrivance of Kim's, but simply beautifully and inevitably as the capture of Mabu's fakir friends by the zealous young policeman at Umbala. They are there with nothing, and, by Jove, it is cold. I am here with all their things. Oh, they will be angry. I am sorry for Hari Babu. Kim might have saved his pity, for though at that moment the Bengali suffered acutely in the flesh, his soul was puffed and lofty. A mile down the hill on the edge of the pine forest, two half-frozen men, one powerfully sick at intervals, were varying mutual recriminations with the most poignant abuse of the Babu, who seemed distraught with terror. They demanded a plan of action. He explained that they were very lucky to be alive, that their coolies, if not then stalking them, had passed beyond recall, that the Raja, his master, was ninety miles away, and so far from lending them money and a retinue for the similar journey, would surely cast them into prison if he had heard that they had hit a priest. He enlarged on this sin and its consequences till they bade him change the subject. Their one hope, he said, was unostentatious flight from village to village till they reached civilization, and for the hundredth time, dissolved into tears, he demanded of the high stars why the Sahibs had beaten the holy man. Ten steps would have taken Hari into the creaking gloom utterly beyond their reach, to the shelter and food of the nearest village, where glib-tongued doctors were scarce. But he preferred to endure cold, belly-pinch, bad words, and occasional blows in the company of his honoured employers. Crouched against a tree-trunk, he sniffed dolefully. "'And have you thought,' said the uninjured man hotly, "'what sort of spectacle we shall present wandering through these hills among these aborigines?' Hari Babu had thought of little else for some hours, but the remark was not to his address. "'We cannot wonder. I can hardly walk,' groaned Kim's victim. "'Perhaps the holy man will be merciful in loving-kindness, sir. Otherwise—' "'I promised myself a peculiar pleasure in emptying my revolver into that young bonds when next we meet,' was the unchristian answer. "'Revolvers? Vengeance? Bonzes? 
Hurry crouched lower. The war was breaking out afresh. "'Have you no consideration for our loss? The baggage! The baggage!' He could hear the speaker literally dancing on the grass. "'Everything we bore! Everything we have secured! Our gains! Eight months' work! Do you know what that means? Decidedly, it is we who can deal with Orientals. Oh, you have done well!' They fell to it in several tongues, and Hurry smiled. Kim was with the kilters, and in the kilters lay eight months of good diplomacy. There was no means of communicating with the boy, but he could be trusted. For the rest, Hurry could so stage-manage the journey through the hills that Hillas, Bunar, and three hundred miles of hill roads should tell the tale for a generation. Men who cannot control their own coolies are little respected in the hills, and the hillman has a very keen sense of humour. "'If I had done it myself,' thought Hurry, "'it would not have been better. And, by Jove, now I think of it, of course, I arranged it myself. How quick I have been! Just when I ran down hill, I thought it. The outrage was accidental, but only me could have worked it. Ah, for all it was damn well worth. Consider the moral effect upon these ignorant people. No treaties, no papers, no written documents at all, and me to interpret for them. How I shall laugh with the Colonel! I wish I had their papers also, but you cannot occupy two places in space simultaneously. That is axiomatic. End of chapter 13《Kim》by Rudyard Kipling. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Kim》by Rudyard Kipling. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter 14 My brother kneels, so saith Kabir, to stone and brass in heathen wise. But in my brother's voice I hear my own unanswered agonies. His God is as his fates assign. His prayer is all the world's and mine. The Prayer At moonrise the cautious coolies got under way. The lama, refreshed by his sleep and the spirit, needed no more than Kim's shoulder to bear him along, a silent, swift-striding man. They held the shale-sprinkled grass for an hour, swept round the shoulder of an immortal cliff, and climbed into a new country entirely blocked off from all sight of Chinny Valley. A huge pasture-ground ran up, fan-shaped, to the living snow. At its base was perhaps half an acre of flat land, on which stood a few soil and timber huts. Behind them, for hill-fashion they were perched on the edge of all things, the ground fell sheer two thousand feet to Shamlich Midden, where never yet man has set foot. The men made no motion to divide the plunder till they had seen the lama bedded down in the best room of the place, with Kim shampooing his feet, Mohammedan fashion. "'We will send food,' said the Ochang man, and the red-topped kilter. By dawn there will be none to give evidence one way or the other. If anything is not needed in the kilter, see here." He pointed through the window, opening into space that was filled with moonlight reflected from the snow, and threw out an empty whisky-bottle. No need to listen for the fall. This is the world's end he said, and went out. The lama looked forth, a hand on either sill, with eyes that shone like yellow opals. From the enormous pit before him white peaks lifted themselves yearning to the moonlight. The rest was as the darkness of interstellar space. "'These,' he said slowly, are indeed my hills. Thus should a man abide, perched above the world, separated from delights, considering vast matters. 
Yes, if he has a chela to prepare tea for him, and to fold a blanket for his head, and to chase out calving cows. A smoky lamp burned in a niche, but the full moonlight beat it down, and by the mixed light swooping above the food cups and bags, Kim moved like a tall ghost. Ay, but now I have let the blood cool. My head still beats and drums, and there is a cord round the back of my neck. No wonder. It was a strong blow. May he who dealt it, but for my own passions there would have been no evil what evil thou hast saved the sahibs from the death they deserved a hundred times the lesson is not well learned chela the lama came to rest on a folded blanket as kim went forward with his evening routine the blow was but a shadow upon a shadow, evil in itself. My legs weary apace these latter days. It met evil in me, anger, rage, and a lust to return evil. These wrought in my blood, woke tumult in my stomach, and dazzled my ears. Here he drank scalding block tea ceremonially, taking the hot cup from Kim's hand. Had I been passionless, the evil blow would have done only bodily evil. A scar or a bruise, which is illusion. But my mind was not abstracted, for rushed in straightway a lust to let the speedy men kill. In fighting that lust my soul was torn and wrenched beyond a thousand blows. Not till I had repeated the blessings—he meant the Buddhist Beatitudes—did I achieve calm. But the evil planted in me by that moment's carelessness works out to its end. Just is the will, swerving not a hair. Learn the lesson, Jela. It is too high for me, Kim muttered. I am still all shaken. I am glad I hurt the man. I felt that sleeping upon my knees in the wood below. It disquieted me in my dreams, the evil in thy soul working through to mine. Yet on the other hand, he loosed his rosary, I have acquired merit by saving two lives, the lives of those that wronged me. Now I must see into the cause of things. The boat of my soul staggers. Sleep and be strong. That is wisest. I meditate. There is a need greater than thou knowest. Till the dawn, hour after hour, as the moonlight paled on the high peaks, and that which had been belted blackness on the sides of the far hills showed as tender green forest, the lama stared fixedly at the wall. From time to time he groaned. Outside the barred door, where discomforted kine came to ask for their old stable, Shamleh and the coolies gave itself up to plunder and riotous living. The O-Chung man was their leader, and once they had opened the sahib's tinned foods and found that they were very good, they dared not turn back. Shamle Kitchen Midden took the dunnage. When Kim, after a night of bad dreams, stole forth to brush his teeth in the morning chill, a fair-coloured woman with turquoise-studded headgear drew him aside. "'The others have gone. They left thee—' This kilta, 
as the promise was. I do not love Sahibs, but thou wilt make us a charm in return for it. We do not wish little Chamla to get a bad name on account of the accident. I am the woman of Shamle. She looked him over with bold, bright eyes, unlike the usual furtive glance of hill-women. Assuredly, but it must be done in secret. She raised the heavy kilter like a toy, and slung it into her own hut. Out, and bar the door. Let none come near till it is finished, said Kim. But afterwards we may talk. Kim tilted the kilter on the floor. A cascade of survey instruments, books, diaries, letters, maps, and queerly scented native correspondence. At the very bottom was an embroidered bag covering a sealed, gilded, and illuminated document such as one king sends to another. Kim caught his breath with delight, and reviewed the situation from a sahib's point of view. "'The books I do not want. Besides, they are logarithms. Survey, I suppose?' He laid them aside. "'The letters I do not understand, but Colonel Crichton will. They must all be kept.' The maps—they draw better maps than me, of course. All the native letters, oh ho, and particularly the Marasla. He sniffed the embroidered bag. That must be from Hillas or Buna, and Hari Babu spoke truth, by Jove. It is a fine haul. I wish Hari could know. The rest must go out of the window. He fingered a superb prismatic compass and the shiny top of a theodolite. But, after all, a sahib cannot very well steal, and the things might be inconvenient evidence later. He sorted out every scrap of manuscript, every map, and the native letters. They made one softish slab. The three locked, feral-backed books, with five worn pocket-books, he put aside. The letters and the marasla I must carry inside my coat and under my belt, and the handwritten books I must put into the food-bag. It will be heavy. No, I do not think that there is anything more. If there is, the coolies have thrown it down the cood. So that is all right. Now, you go too. He repacked the kilter, with all he meant to lose, and hove it up on to the window-sill. A thousand feet below lay a long, lazy, round-shouldered bank of mist, as yet untouched by the morning sun. A thousand feet below that was a hundred-year-old pine forest. He could see the green tops looking like a bed of moss when a wind eddy thinned the cloud. No, I don't think any one will go after you. The wheeling basket vomited its contents as it dropped. The theodolite hit a jutting cliff-edge and exploded like a shell. The books, inkstands, paint-boxes, compasses, and rulers showed for a few seconds like a swarm of bees. Then they vanished, and though Kim, hanging half out of the window, strained his young ears, never a sound came up from the gulf. Five hundred, a thousand rupees could not buy them, he thought sorrowfully. It was very wasteful, but I have all their other stuff, everything they did, I hope. Now, how the deuce am I to tell Hari Babu, and what the deuce am I to do? And my old man is sick. I must tie up the letters in oilskin. That is something to do first, else they will get all sweated. And I am all alone. He bound them into a neat package swedging down the stiff, sticky oilskin at the corners, for his roving life had made him as methodical as an old hunter in matters of the road. Then, with double care, he packed away the books at the bottom of the food-bag. The woman rapped at the door. "'But thou hast made no charm,' she said, looking about. "'There is no need.' Kim had completely overlooked the necessity for a little patter-talk. The woman laughed at his confusion irreverently. "'None for thee. Thou canst cast a spell by a mere winking of an eye. But think of us poor people when thou art gone. 
they were all too drunk last night to hear a woman. Thou art not drunk? I am a priest. Kim had recovered himself, and the woman, being aught but unlovely, thought best to stand on his office. I warn them that the Sahibs will be angry, and will make an inquisition, and a report to the Raja. There is also the Babu with them. Clerks have long tongues. Is that all thy trouble? The plan rose fully formed in Kim's mind, and he smiled ravishingly. Not all, quoth the woman, putting out a hard brown hand, all covered with turquoises set in silver. I can finish that in a breath, he went on quickly. The Babu is the very Hakim, thou hast heard of him, who was wandering among the hills by Ziglau. I know him. He will tell for the sake of a reward. Sahibs cannot distinguish one hillman from another, but Babus have eyes for men and women. Carry a word to him from me. There is nothing I would not do for thee. He accepted the compliment calmly, as men must in lands where women make the love, tore a leaf from a notebook, and, with a patient, indelible pencil, wrote in gross shikast, the script that bad little boys use when they write dirt on walls. I have everything they have written, their pictures of the country and many letters, especially the Murasla. Tell me what to do. I am at Shamlich under the snow. The old man is sick. Take this to him. It will altogether shut his mouth. He cannot have gone far. Indeed, no. They are still in the forest across the spur. Our children went to watch them when the light came, and have cried the news as they moved. Kim looked his astonishment. But from the edge of the sheep pasture floated a shrill, kite-like trill. A child, tending cattle, had picked it up from a brother or sister on the far side of the slope that commanded Chinny Valley. "'My husbands are all out there gathering wood.' She drew a handful of walnuts from her bosom, split one neatly, and began to eat. Kim affected blank ignorance. "'Dost thou not know the meaning of the walnut, priest?' she said coyly, and handed him the half-shells. Well thought of, he slipped the piece of paper between them quickly. Hast thou a little wax to close them on this letter? The woman sighed aloud, and Kim relented. There is no payment till service has been rendered. Carry this to the Babu, and say it was sent by the son of the charm. Ay, truly, truly, by a magician who is like a sahib. Nay, a son of the charm and ask if there be any answer. But if he offer a rudeness, I am afraid. Kim laughed. He is, I have no doubt, very tired and very hungry. The hills make cold bedfellows. Hi, my— It was on the tip of his tongue to say mother, but he turned it to sister. Thou art a wise and witty woman. By this time— all the villages know what has befallen the sahibs, eh? True. News was at Ziglau by midnight, and by tomorrow should be at Kotgar. The villages are both afraid and angry. No need. Tell the villagers to feed the sahibs and pass them on in peace. We must get them quietly away from our valleys. To steal is one thing. To kill— another. The Babu will understand, and there will be no after-complaints. Be swift. I must tend my master when he wakes. So be it. After service, thou hast said, comes the reward. I am the woman of Shamlech, and I hold from the Raja. I am no common bearer of babes. Shamlech is thine, who fed horn and hide, Milk and butter, take or leave. She turned resolutely uphill, her silver necklaces clicking on her broad breast to meet the morning sun fifteen hundred feet above them. This time Kim thought in the vernacular as he waxed down the oilskin edges of the packets. How can a man follow the way or the great game 
when he is so always pestered by women. There was the girl at Akrola of the Ford, and there was the scullion's wife behind the dovecot, not counting the others. And now comes this one. When I was a child it was well enough, but now I am a man, and they will not regard me as a man. Walnuts, indeed! Ho, ho! It is almonds in the plains!" He went out to levy on the village, not with a begging-bowl, which might do for down-country, but in the manner of a prince. Shamlech's summer population is only three families, four women and eight or nine men. They were all full of tinned meats and mixed drinks, from ammoniated quinine to white vodka, for they had taken their full share of the overnight loot. The neat continental tents had been cut up and shared long ago, and there were patent aluminium saucepans abroad. But they considered the lama's presence a perfect safeguard against all consequences, and impenitently brought Kim of their best, even to a drink of chung, the barley beer that comes from Ladakh way. Then they thawed out in the sun, and sat with their legs hanging over infinite abysses, chattering, laughing, and smoking. They judged India and its government solely from their experience of wandering sahibs who had employed them or their friends as shikaris. Kim heard tales of shots missed upon ibex, suro, or makur by sahibs twenty years in their graves, every detail lighted from behind like twigs on treetops seen against lightning. They told him of their little diseases and, more important, the diseases of their tiny, sure-footed cattle, of trips as far as Kotgar, where the strange missionaries live, and beyond even to marvellous Simla, where the streets are paved with silver, and any one, look you, can get service with the sahibs who ride about in two-wheeled carts and spend money with a spade. Presently, grave and aloof, Walking very heavily, the lama joined himself to the chatter under the eaves, and they gave him great room. The thin air refreshed him, and he sat on the edge of precipices with the best of them, and, when talk languished, flung pebbles into the void. Thirty miles away, as the eagle flies, lay the next range, seamed and channeled, and pitted with little patches of brush, forests each a day's dark march. Behind the village, Shamle Hill, itself cut off all view to southward. It was like sitting in a swallow's nest, under the eaves of the roof of the world. From time to time the lama stretched out his hand, and with a little low-voiced prompting would point out the road to speak and north across the Parangla. "'Beyond where the hills lie thickest lies Dechen,' he meant Hanley. The great monastery. Star Chan Ras Chen built it, and of him there runs this tale. Whereupon he told it. A fantastic piled narrative of bewitchment and miracles that set Shamlay a gasping. Turning west a little, he speared for the green hills of Kulu, and sought Kailung under the glaciers. For thither came I in the old days, from Leh I came, over the Baralachi. Yes, yes, we know it, said the far-faring people of Shamle. And I slept two nights with the priests of Galong. These are hills of my delight, shadows blessed above all other shadows. There my eyes opened on this world, there my eyes were opened to this world. There I found enlightenment, and there I girt my loins for my search. Out of the hills I came, the high hills, and the strong winds. Oh, just is the wheel! He blessed them in detail the great glaciers, the naked rocks, the piled moraines and tumbled shale, dry upland, hidden salt lake, age-old timber and fruitful water-shot valley 
one after the other, as a dying man blesses his folk, and Kim marvelled at his passion. "'Yes, yes, there is no place like our hills,' said the people of Shamlech, and they fell to wondering how a man could live in the hot, terrible plains, where the cattle run as big as elephants, unfit to plough on a hillside, where village touches village, they had heard, for a hundred miles, where folk went about stealing in gangs, and what the robbers spared, the police carried utterly away. So the still forenoon wore through, and at the end of it Kim's messenger dropped from the steep pasture as unbreathed as when she had set out. "'I sent a word to the Hakim," Kim explained, while she made reverence. "'He joined himself to the idolaters. Nay, I remember he did a healing upon one of them. He has acquired merit, though the healed employed his strength for evil. Just is the wheel. What of the Hakim? I feared that thou hast been bruised, and I knew he was wise. Kim took the waxed walnut shell and read in English on the back of his note. Your favour received. Cannot get away from present company at present but shall take them into Simla, after which hope to rejoin you. Inexpedient to follow angry gentlemen, return by same road you came, and will overtake. Highly gratified about correspondence due to my forethought. He says, Holy One, that he will escape from the idolaters and will return to us. Shall we wait a while at Shamlech, then? The lama looked long and lovingly upon the hills, and shook his head. "'That may not be, Chela, for my bones outward do I desire it, but it is forbidden. I have seen the cause of things.' "'Why, when the hills give thee back thy strength, day by day? Remember we were weak and fainting down below there in the dune.' I became strong to do evil and to forget. A brawler and a swashbuckler upon the hillside was I. Kim bit back a smile. Just and perfect is the wheel swerving not a hair. When I was a man a long time ago, I did pilgrimage to Guru Chuan among the poplars, he pointed Botan woods, where they keep the sacred horse. Quiet, be quiet, said Shamlech, all arow. He speaks of Jamlinitkor, the horse that can go round the world in a day. I speak to my jailer only, said the lama, in gentle reproof and they scattered like frost on south eaves of a morning. I did not seek truth in those days, but the talk of doctrine, all illusion. I drank the beer and ate the bread of Guru Chuan. Next day one said, We go out to fight Sangor Gutok down the valley to discover— Mark again how lust is tied to anger. Which abbot shall bear rule in the valley, and take the profit of the prayers they print at Sangor Gutok? I went, and we fought a day. But how, holy one? With our long pen-cases. As I could have shown, I say we fought under the poplars, both abbots and all the monks, and one laid open my forehead to the bone, see!" He tilted back his cap, and showed a puckered silvery scar. "'Just and perfect is the wheel. Yesterday the scar itched, and after fifty years I recalled how it was dealt 
and the face of him who dealt it, dwelling a little in illusion. Follow that which thou didst see, strife and stupidity. This is the wheel. The idolater's blow fell upon the scar. Then I was shaken in my soul. My soul was darkened, and the boat of my soul rocked upon the waters of illusion. Not till I came to Shamlech could I meditate upon the cause of things, or trace the running grass-roots of evil. I strove all the long night. But, Holy One, thou art innocent of all evil. May I be thy sacrifice? Kim was genuinely distressed at the old man's sorrow, and Mahbub Ali's phrase slipped out unawares. In the dawn, the lama went on more gravely, ready rosary clicking between the slow sentences. Came enlightenment. It is here. I am an old man. Hill bred, hill fed, never to sit down among my hills. Three years I travelled through Hind, but can earth be stronger than Mother Earth? My stupid body yearned to the hills and the snow of the hills from below there. I said, and it is true, my search is sure. So at the Kulu woman's house I turned hillward, over-persuaded by myself. There is no blame to the Hakim. He, following desire, foretold that the hills would make me strong. They strengthened me to do evil, to forget my search. I delighted in life and the lust of life. I desired strong slopes to climb. I cast about to find them. I measured the strength of my body, which is evil, against the high hills. I made a mock of thee when thy breath came short under Jamnotri. I jested when thou wouldst not face the snow of the pass. But what harm? I was afraid. It was just. I am not a hillman, and I love thee for thy new strength. More than once I remember. He rested his cheek dolefully on his hand. I sought thy praise and the Hakim's for the mere strength of my legs. Thus evil followed evil till the cup was full, just is the will. All Hind for three years did me all honour, from the fountain of wisdom in the Wonder House to— He smiled. A little child playing by a big gun. The world prepared my road. And why? Because we loved thee. It is only the fever of the blow. I myself am still sick and shaken. No, it was because I was upon the way. Turned as are Sinen symbols to the purpose of the lore. I departed from that ordinance. The tune was broken, followed the punishment. In my own hills, on the edge of my own country, in the very place of my evil desire, comes the buffet here, he touched his brow, as a novice is beaten when he misplaces the cups. So am I beaten, who was abbot of Suchsen. No word, look you, but a blow, Chela. But the Sahibs did not know thee, Holy One? We were well matched. Ignorance and lust meant ignorant and lust upon the road, 
and they begat anger. The blow was a sign to me, who am no better than a strayed yak, that my place is not here. Who can read the cause of an act is halfway to freedom. Back to the path, says the blow. The hills are not made for thee. Thou canst not choose freedom, and go in bondage to the delight of life. Would that we had never met that cursed Russian. Our Lord himself cannot make the wheel swing backward, and for my merit that I had acquired, I gain yet another sign. He put his hand in his bosom, and drew forth the wheel of life. Look! I considered this after I had meditated. There remains untoward by the idolater no more than the breadth of my finger-nail. I see. So much, then, is the span of my life in this body. I have served the wheel all my days. Now the wheel serves me. But for the merit I have acquired in guiding thee upon the way, there would have been added to me yet another life ere I had found my river. Is that plain, Chela? Kim stared at the brutally disfigured chart. From left to right, diagonally, the rent ran, from the eleventh house where desire gives birth to the child, as it is drawn by the Tibetans, across the human and animal worlds to the fifth house, the empty house of the senses. The logic was unanswerable. Before our Lord won enlightenment, the lama folded all away with reverence. He was tempted. I too have been tempted. But it is finished. The arrow fell in the plains, not in the hills. Therefore, what make we here? Shall we at least wait for the Hakim? I know how long I shall live in this body. What can a Hakim do? But thou art all sick and shaken. Thou canst not walk. How can I be sick if I see freedom? He rose unsteadily to his feet. Then I must get food from the village. Oh, the weary road! Kim felt that he too needed rest. That is lawful. Let us eat and go. The arrow fell in the plains, but I yielded to desire. Make ready, Chela. Kim turned to the woman with the turquoise headgear, who had been idly pitching pebbles over the cliff. She smiled very kindly. I found him like a strayed buffalo in a cornfield, the babu, snorting and sneezing with cold. He was so hungry that he forgot his dignity and gave me sweet words. The sahibs have nothing. She flung out an empty palm. One is very sick about the stomach. Thy work? Kim nodded with a bright eye. I spoke to the Bengali first and to the people of a nearby village after. The sahibs will be given food as they need it, nor will the people ask money. The plunder is already distributed. The babu makes lying speeches to the sahibs. Why does he not leave them? Out of the greatness of his heart. Was never a Bengali yet had one bigger than a dried walnut, but it is no matter. Now, as to walnuts, after service comes reward. I have said the village is thine. It is my loss, Kim began. Even now I had planned desirable things in my heart which— There is no need to go through the compliments proper to these occasions. He sighed deeply. But my master, led by a vision— Ah! What can old eyes see except a full begging bowl? Turns from this village— to the plains again. Bid him stay. Kim shook his head. I know my Holy One and his rage if he be crossed. 
he replied impressively. "'His curses shake the hills.' "'Pity they did not save him from a broken head. "'I heard that thou wast the tiger-hearted one who smote the Sahib. "'Let him dream a little longer. Stay!' "'Hill woman,' said Kim, with austerity that could not harden the outlines of his young oval face, "'these matters are too high for thee. "'The gods be good to us, since when have men and women been other than men and women?' A priest is a priest. He says he will go upon this hour. I am his chela, and I go with him. We need food for the road. He is an honoured guest in all the villages, but— He broke into a pure boy's grin. The food here is good. Give me some. What if I do not give it to thee? I am the woman of this village. Then I curse thee a little, not greatly, but enough to remember. He could not help smiling. "'Thou hast cursed me already by the down-dropped eyelash and the uplifted chin. Curses? Why should I care for mere words?' She clenched her hands upon her bosom. "'But I would not have thee go in anger, thinking hardly of me, a gatherer of cow-dung and grass at Shamlech, but still a woman of substance.' "'I think nothing,' said Kim but that I am grieved to go, for I am very weary, and that we need food. Here is the bag." The woman snatched it angrily. "'I was foolish,' she said. "'Who is thy woman in the plains, fair or black? I was fair once. Laughest thou? Once, long ago, if thou canst believe, a Sahib looked upon me with favour. Once, long ago, I wore European clothes at the mission-house yonder she pointed toward Kotgar. Once, long ago, I was Kurlistian, and spoke English, as the Sahib speak it. Yes, my Sahib said he would return and wed me. Yes, wed me. He went away. I had nursed him when he was sick, but he never returned. Then I saw that the gods of the Kurlistians lied. I went back to my own people. I have never set eyes on a Sahib since. Do not laugh at me. The fit is past, little priestling. Thy face and thy walk and thy fashion of speech put me in mind of my sahib, though thou art only a wandering mendicant to whom I give a dole. Curse me! Thou canst neither curse nor bless. She set her hands on her hips and laughed bitterly. Thy gods are lies, thy works are lies, thy words are lies. There are no gods under all the heavens. I know it. But for a while I thought it was my Sahib come back, and he was my god. Yes, once I made music on a piano in the mission house at Kotgar. Now I give alms to priests who are heathen. She wound up with the English word and tied the mouth of the brimming bag. "'I wait for thee, Chela, said the lama, leaning against the doorpost. The woman swept the tall figure with her eyes. "'He walk? He cannot cover half a mile. Whither would old bones go?' At this Kim, already perplexed by the lama's collapse and foreseeing the weight of the bag, fairly lost his temper. "'What is it to thee, woman of ill omen, where he goes?' "'Nothing!' But something to thee, priest with a sahib's face. Wilt thou carry him on thy shoulders? I go to the plains. None must hinder my return. I have wrestled with my soul till I am strengthless. The stupid body is spent, and we are far from the plains. Behold! she said simply, and drew aside to let Kim see her own utter helplessness. Curse me! Maybe it will give him strength. Make a charm. Call on thy great god. Thou art a priest." She turned away. The lama had squatted limply, still holding by the doorpost. One cannot strike down an old man that he recovers again like a boy in a night. Weakness bowed him to the earth, but his eyes that hung on Kim were alive and imploring. "'It is all well,' said Kim. 
It is the thin air that weakens thee. In a little while we go. It is the mountain sickness. I, too, am a little sick at stomach." And he knelt and comforted with such poor words as came first to his lips. Then the woman returned, more erect than ever. "'Thy God's useless, eh? Try mine. I am the woman of Shamlech." She hailed hoarsely, and there came out of a cow-pen her two husbands, and three others with a dooley, the rude native litter of the hills, that they use for carrying the sick, and for visits of state. "'These cattle—she did not condescend to look at them—are thine for so long as thou shalt need. "'But we will not go similar way. We will not go near the Sahibs,' cried the first husband. They will not run away as the others did, nor will they steal baggage. Two I know for weaklings. Stand to the pent-pole, Sonu and Tari." They obeyed swiftly. "'Lower now, and lift in that holy man. I will see to the village and your virtuous wives till ye return.' "'When will that be?' "'Ask the priests. Do not pester me. Lay the food-bag at the foot. It balances better so. Oh, holy one, thy hills are kinder than our plains, cried Kim, relieved, as the lama tottered to the litter. It is a very king's bed, a place of honour and ease, and we owe it to— A woman of ill omen, I need thy blessings as much as I do thy curses. It is my order, and none of thine. Lift and away. Here, hast thou money for the road? She beckoned Kim to her hut, and stooped above a battered English cash-box under her cot. "'I do not need anything,' said Kim, angered where he should have been grateful. "'I am already rudely loaded with favours. She looked up with a curious smile, and laid a hand on his shoulder. "'At least thank me. I am foul-faced and a hill-woman, but as thy talk goes, I have acquired merit.' Shall I show thee how the Sahibs render thanks?" And her hard eyes softened. "'I am but a wandering priest,' said Kim, his eyes lighting in answer. "'Thou needst neither my blessings nor my curses.' "'Nay, but for one little moment thou canst overtake the Dooley in ten strides. If thou wast a Sahib, shall I show thee what thou wouldst do?' "'How if I guess, though?' said Kim, and, putting his arm around her waist, he kissed her on the cheek, adding in English, "'Thank you very much, my dear.' Kissing is practically unknown among Asiatics, which may have been the reason that she leaned back with wide open eyes and a face of panic. "'Next time,' Kim went on, "'you must not be so sure of your heathen priests. Now I say good-bye.' He held out his hand, English fashion. She took it mechanically. "'Good-bye, my dear.' "'Good-bye, and—and—' She was remembering her English words one by one. "'You will come back again. Good-bye, and thee God bless you.' Half an hour later, as the creaking litter jolted up the hill-path that leads southeasterly from Shamlech, Kim saw a tiny figure at the hut-door, waving a white rag. She has acquired merit above all others, said the lama, for to set a man upon the way to freedom is half as great as though she herself had found it. Hm, said Kim, thoughtfully, considering the past. It may be that I have acquired merit also. At least she did not treat me like a child. He hitched the front of his robe, where lay the slab of documents and maps, restowed the precious food-bag at the lama's feet, laid his hand on the litter's edge, and buckled down to the slow pace of the grunting husbands. "'These also acquire merit,' said the lama, after three miles. "'More than that, they shall be paid in silver,' quoth Kim. The woman of Shamlech had given it to him, and it was only fair, he argued, that her men should earn it back again. End of chapter 14
by Roger Kipling. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Kim by Roger Kipling. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter 15, Part 1. I'd not give room for an emperor. I'd hold my road for a king. To the triple crown I'd not bow down. But this is a different thing. I'll not fight with powers of air. Sentry, pass him through. Drawbridge let fall. He's the lord of all. The dreamer whose dream came true. The Siege of the Fairies Two hundred miles north of Chini, on the blue shale of Ladakh, lies Yanklin Sahib, the merry-minded man, spy-glassing wrathfully across the ridges for some signs of his pet trafficker, a man from Ochung. But that renegade, with a new man-licker rifle and two hundred cartridges, is elsewhere, shooting musk-deer for the market, and Yanklin Sahib will learn next season how very ill he has been. Up the valleys of Bushar the far-beholding eagles of the Himalayas swerve at his new blue-and-white gourd umbrella. Hurries a Bengali, once fat and well-looking, now lean and weather-worn. He has received the thanks of two foreigners of distinction, piloted not unskilfully to Mashobra Tunnel, which leads to the great and gay capital of India. It was not his fault that, blanketed by wet mists, he conveyed them past the telegraph station and the European colony of Kotgar. It was not his fault, but that of the gods, of whom he discoursed so engagingly, that he led them into the borders of Nahan where the Raja of that state mistook them for deserting British soldiery. Hari Babu explained the greatness and glory in their own country of his companions, till the drowsy kinglet smiled. He explained it to everyone who asked, many times aloud, variously. He begged food, arranged accommodation, proved a skilful leech for an injury of the groin, such a blow as one might receive rolling down a rock-covered hillside in the dark, and in all things indispensable. The reason of his friendliness did him credit. With millions of fellow serfs he had learned to look upon Russia as the great deliverer from the north. He was a fearful man. He had been afraid that he could not save his illustrious employers from the anger of an excited peasantry. He would have just as lief hit a holy man as not, but he was deeply grateful and sincerely rejoiced that he had done his little possible toward bringing their venture to, barring the lost baggage, a successful issue. He had forgotten the blows, denied that blows had been dealt that unseemingly first night under the pines. He asked neither pension nor retaining fee, but if they deemed him worthy, would they write him a testimonial? It might be useful to him later if others, their friends, came over the passes. He begged them to remember him in their future greatnesses, for he opined subtly that he, even he, Mahendro Lal Dut M. A. of Calcutta, had done the state some service. They gave him a certificate praising his courtesy, helpfulness, and unerring skill as a guide. He put it in his waist-belt and sobbed with emotion. They had endured so many dangers together. He led them at high noon along crowded Simla Mal to the Alliance Bank of Simla, where they wished to establish their identity. Thence he vanished like a dawn cloud on Jacko. Behold him, too fine drawn to sweat, too pressed to vaunt the drugs in his little brass-bound box, ascending Shamless slope, a just man made perfect. Watch him, all Babudom laid aside, smoking at noon on a cot, while a woman with turquoise-studded headgear points southeasterly across the bare grass. Litters, she said, do not travel as fast as single men, but his birds should now be in the plains. The holy man would not stay, 
though Lispeth pressed him, the Babu groans heavily, girds up his huge loins, and is off again. He does not care to travel after dusk, but his day's marches—there is none to enter them in a book—would astonish folk who mock at his race. Kindly villagers, remembering the Dakar drug vendor of two months ago, give him shelter against evil spirits of the wood. He dreams of Bengali gods, university textbooks of education, and the Royal Society, London, England. Next dawn the bobbing blue-and-white umbrella goes forth. On the edge of Dune, Masuri well behind them, and the plains spread out in golden dust before, rests a worn litter in which, all the hills know it, lies a sick lama who seeks a river for his healing. Villages have almost come to blows over the honour of bearing it, but not only had the lama given them blessings, but his disciple good money, full one-third Saib's prices. Twelve miles a day has the duly travelled, as the greasy, rubbed pole-ends show, and by roads that few Saibs use. Over the Nilang Pass, in storm, when the driven snow-dust filled every fold of the impassive lama's drapery, between the black horns of Rayang, where they heard the whistle of the wild goats through the clouds, pitching and strained on the shale below, hard held between shoulder and clenched jaw when they rounded the hideous curves of the cut road under Bagirati swinging and creaking to the steady jog-trot of the descent into the valley of the waters, pressed along the steamy levels of that locked valley, up, up, and out again to meet the roaring gusts off Kedarnath, set down of middays in the dun gloom of kindly oak forests, passed from village to village in dawn chill, when even devotees may be forgiven for swearing at impatient holy men, or by torchlight, when the least fearful think of ghosts, the Dooley has reached her last stage. The little hill-folk sweat in the modified heat of the lower Siwaliks, and gather round the priests for their blessing and their wage. "'Ye have acquired merit,' says the Lama. Merit greater than your knowing, and ye will return to the hills, he sighs. Surely the high hills as soon as may be. The bearer rubs his shoulder, drinks water, spits it out again, and readjusts his grass sandal. Kim, his face is drawn and tired, pays very small silver from his belt heaves out the food-bag, crams an oilskin packet—they are holy writings—into his bosom, and helps the lama to his feet. The peace has come again into the old man's eyes, and he does not look for the hills to fall down and crush him, as he did that terrible night when they were delayed by the flooded river. The men pick up the dooley, and swing out of sight between the scrub clumps. The lama raises a hand toward the rampart of the Himalayas. "'Not with you, O oh, blessed among all hills, fell the arrow of our Lord, and never shall I breathe your airs again.' "'But thou art ten times the stronger man in this good air,' says Kim, for to his wearied soul appeal the well-cropped kindly plains. Here or hereabouts fell the arrow, yes. We will go very softly, perhaps a course a day, for the search is sure, but the bag weighs heavy. Ay, our search is sure. I have come out of great temptation. It was never more than a couple of miles a day now, and Kim's shoulders bore all the weight of it the burden of an old man, the burden of the heavy food-bag with the locked books, the load of the writings on his heart, and the details of the daily routine. He begged in the dawn, set blankets for the lama's meditation, 
held the weary head on his lap through the noonday heats, fanning away the flies till his wrists ached, begged again in the evenings, and rubbed the lama's feet, who rewarded him with promise of freedom, to-day, to-morrow, or at furthest the next day. "'Never was such a chela. I doubt at times whether Ananda more faithfully nursed our Lord. And thou art a Sahib? When I was a man a long time ago, I forgot that. Now I look upon thee often, and every time I remember that thou art a Sahib. It is strange. Thou hast said there is neither black nor white. Why plague me with this talk, holy one? Let me rub the other foot. It vexes me. I am not a sahib. I am thy chela, and my head is heavy on my shoulders. Patience a little. We reach freedom together. Then thou and I upon the far bank of the river will look back upon our lives as in the hills we saw our day's marches laid out behind us. Perhaps I was once a sahib. Was never a sahib like thee, I swear it. I am certain the keeper of the images in the Wonder House was in past life a very wise abbot. But even his spectacles do not make my eyes see. There fall shadows when I would look steadily. No matter. We know the tricks of the poor stupid carcass. Shadow changing to another shadow. I am bound by the illusion of time and space. How far came we today in the flesh? Perhaps half a kos? Three quarters of a mile, and it was a weary march. Half a kos! Ha! Ah, I went ten thousand thousand in the spirit. How we are all lapped and swathed and swaddled in these senseless things! He looked at his thin, blue-veined hand that found the beads so heavy. Chela, hast thou never a wish to leave me? Kim thought of the oilskin packet and the books in the food bag. If someone duly authorized would only take delivery of them, the great game might play itself for aught he then cared. He was tired and hot in his head, and a cough that came from the stomach worried him. No! he said almost sternly. I am not a dog or a snake to bite when I have learned to love. Thou art too tender towards me. Not that either. I have moved in one matter without consulting thee. I have sent a message to the Kulu woman by that woman who gave us the goat's milk this morn, saying that thou wast a little feeble and wouldst need a litter. I beat myself in my mind that I did not do it when we entered the dune. We stay in this place till the litter returns. I am content. She is a woman with a heart of gold, as thou sayest, but a talker, something of a talker. She will not weary thee. I have looked to that also. Holy One, my heart is very heavy for my many carelessnesses towards thee. An hysterical catch rose in his throat. I have walked thee too far. I have not picked good food always for thee. I have not considered the heat. I have talked to people on the road and left thee alone. I have, I have, hi, my, but I love thee, and it is all too late. I was a child. Oh, why was I not a man? Overborne by strain, fatigue, and the weight beyond his years, Kim broke down and sobbed at the lama's feet. What a to-do is here, said the old man gently. 
thou hast never stepped a hair's breadth from the way of obedience. Neglect me? Child, I have lived on thy strength as an old tree lived on the lime of a new wall. Day by day, since Shamlech down, I have stolen strength from thee. Therefore, not through any sin of thine art thou weakened. It is the body, the silly, stupid body that speaks now, not the assured soul. Be comforted. No, at least the devils that thou fightest. They are earth-born children of illusion. We will go to the woman from Gulu. She shall acquire merit in housing us, and specially in tending me. Thou shalt run free till strength returns. I had forgotten the stupid body. If there be any blame, I bear it. But we are too close to the gates of deliverance to weigh blame. I could praise thee, but what need? In a little, in a very little, we shall sit beyond all needs. So he petted and comforted Kim with wise saws and grave texts on that little understood beast, our body, who, being but a delusion, insists on posing as the soul to the darkening of the way and the immense multiplication of unnecessary devils. Hi, my! Let us talk of the woman from Kulu. Think you she will ask for another charm for her grandsons? When I was a young man, a very long time ago, I was plagued with these vapours and some others, and I went to an abbot, a very holy man, and a seeker after truth, though then I knew it not. Sit up and listen, child of my soul. My tale was told. Said he to me, Jayla, know this. There are many lies in the world, and not a few liars, but there are no liars like our bodies, except it be the sensations of our bodies. Considering this, I was comforted, and of his great favour he suffered me to drink tea in his presence. Suffer me now to drink tea, for I am thirsty. With a laugh across his tears, Kim kissed the lama's feet, and set about the tea-making. Thou leanst on me in the body, holy one, but I lean on thee for some other things. Dost know it? I have guessed, maybe, and the lama's eyes twinkled. We must change that. So when, with scufflings and scrapings and a hot air of importance, paddled up nothing less than the Saiba's pet palanquin, sent twenty miles with that same grizzled old Oria servant in charge, and when they reached the disorderly order of the long, white, rambling house behind Saranapur, the lama took his own measures. Said the Saiba cheerily from an upper window after compliments, "'What is the good of an old woman's advice to an old man? I told thee, I told thee, holy one, to keep an eye upon the chela. How didst thou do it? Never answer me. I know. He has been running among the women. Look at his eyes, hollow and sunk. And the betraying line from the nose down. He has been sifted out. Fie, fie, and a priest, too. Kim looked up, over-weary to smile, shaking his head in denial. Do not jest, said the lama. What time is done? That time is done. We are here upon great matters. A sickness of soul took me in the hills, and him a sickness of the body. 
Since then I have lived upon his strength, eating him. Children together, young and old, she sniffed, but forbore to make any new jokes. May this present hospitality restore thee. Hold a while, and I will come to gossip of the high good hills. At evening time, her son-in-law was returned, so she did not need to go on inspection round the farm, she won to the meat of the matter, explained low-voicedly by the lama. The two old heads nodded wisely together. Kim had reeled to a room with a cot in it, and was dozing soddenly. The lama had forbidden him to set blankets or to get food. "'I know, I know. Who but I?' she cackled. "'We who go down to the burning ghats clutch at the hands of those coming up from the river of life with full water-jars. Yes, brimming water-jars. I did the boy wrong. He lent thee his strength. It is true that the old eat the young daily. Stands now we must restore him.' "'Thou hast many times acquired merit.' "'My merit?' What is it? Old bag of bones making curries for men who do not ask who cooked this. Now, if it were stored up for my grandson. He that had the belly pain. To think the Holy One remembers that. I must tell his mother. It is most singular honour. He that had the belly pain straight away the Holy One remembered. She will be proud. My jailer is to me as is a son to the unenlightened. Say, grandson, rather. Mothers have not the wisdom of our years. If a child cries, they say the heavens are falling. Now a grandmother is far enough separated from the pain of bearing and the pleasure of giving the breast to consider whether a cry is wickedness, pure, or the wind. And since thou speakest once again of wind, when last the Holy One was here, maybe I offended in pressing for charms. Sister, said the lama, using that form of address a Buddhist monk may sometimes employ towards a nun, if charms comfort thee, they are better than ten thousand doctors. I say, if they comfort me, I, who was abbot of Sudsen, will make as many as thou mayst desire. I have never seen thy face. That even the monkeys who steal our loquats count for again. He <laughs> he! But as he who sleeps there said, he nodded at the shut door of the guest chamber across the forecourt, thou hast a heart of gold. And he is in the spirit of my very grandson to me. Good. I am the Holy One's cow. This was pure Hinduism, but the lama never heeded. I am old. I have born sons in the body. Oh, once I could please men. Now I can cure them. He heard her armlets tinkle as though she bared arms for action. I will take over the boy, and dose him, and stuff him, and make him whole. Hi, my! We old people know something yet. Wherefore, when Kim, aching in every bone, opened his eyes, and would go to the cook-house to get his master's food, he found strong coercion about him, and a veiled old figure at the door, flanked by the grizzled man-servant, who told him very precisely the things he was on no account to do. Thou must have? Thou shalt have nothing. What? A locked box in which to keep holy books? Oh, that is another matter. Heavens forbid I should come between a priest and his prayers. It shall be brought, and thou shalt keep the key. They pushed the coffer under his cot, and Kim shut away Mabub's pistol, the oilskin packet of letters, and the locked books and diaries with a groan of relief. For some absurd idea their weight on his shoulders was nothing to their weight on his poor mind. His neck ached under it of nights. 
Thine is a sickness uncommon in youth these days, since young folk have given up tending to their betters. The remedy is sleep, and certain drugs," said the Saiba, and he was glad to give himself up to the blankness that half menaced and half soothed him. She brewed drinks in some mysterious Asiatic equivalent to the still room, drenches that smelt pestilently and tasted worse. She stood over Kim till they went down, and inquired exhaustively after they had come up. She laid a taboo upon the forecourt, and enforced it by means of an armed man. It was true he was seventy-odd, that his scabbarded sword ceased at the hilt, but he represented the authority of the Sahiba, and loaded wains, chattering servants, calves, dogs, hens, and the like, fetched a wide compass by those parts. Best of all, when the body was cleared, she cut out from the mass of poor relations that crowded the back of the buildings—household dogs, we name them—a cousin's widow skilled in what Europeans, who know nothing about it, call massage. And the two of them, laying him east and west, that the mysterious earth-currents which thrill the clay of our bodies might help and not hinder, took him to pieces all one long afternoon bone by bone, muscle by muscle, ligament by ligament, and lastly nerve by nerve. Kneaded to irresponsible pulp, half hypnotized by the perpetual flick and readjustment of the uneasy chudurs that veiled their eyes, Kim slid ten thousand miles into slumber. Thirty-six hours of it. Sleep that soaked like rain after drought. End of chapter 15, part 1Part two, the last section. Then she fed him, and the house spun to her clamour. She caused fowls to be slain, she sent for vegetables, and the sober, slow-thinking gardener, nigh as old as she, sweated for it. She took spices and milk and onion, and, with a little fish from the brooks, anon limes for sherbets, fat quails from the pits, then chicken livers upon a skewer, with spiced ginger between. "'I have seen something of this world,' she said over the crowded trays, "'and there are but two sorts of women in it. Those who take the strength out of a man, and those who put it back. Once I was that one, now I am this. Nay, do not play the priestling with me. Mine was but a jest. If it does not hold good now, it will when thou takes the road again. Cousin, this to the poor relation, never wearied of extolling her patroness's charity, he is getting a bloom on the skin of a new curried horse. Our work is like polishing jewels to be thrown to a dance girl, eh? Kim sat up and smiled. The terrible weakness had dropped for him like an old shoe. His tongue itched for free speech again, but a week back the lightest word clogged it like ashes. The pain in his neck—he must have caught it from the llama—had gone with the heavy denue-aches and the evil taste in the mouth. The two old women, a little but not much more careful about their veils now, clucked as merrily as the hens that entered pecking through the open door. "'Where is my Holy One?' he demanded. "'Hear him! Thy Holy One is well!' she snapped viciously. "'Though that is none of his merit. Knew I a charm to make him wise, I'd sell my jewels and buy it. To refuse good food that I cooked myself, and go roving into the fields for two nights on an empty belly, and to tumble into a brook at the end of it, can you call that holiness?' Then, when he has nearly broken what thou hast left of my heart with anxiety, he tells me that he has a quiet merit. Oh, how like are all men! 
No, that was not it. He tells me that he is freed from all sin. I could have told him that before he wetted himself all over. He is well now. This happened a week ago. But burn me such holiness! A babe of three would do better. Do not fret thyself for the Holy One. He keeps both eyes on thee when he is not wading our brooks. I do not remember to have seen him. I remember that the days and nights passed like bars of white and black, opening and shutting. I was not sick. I was but tired. A lethargy that comes by right some few score years later. But it is done now. Maharani, Kim began, but led by the look in her eye, changed it to the title of plain love. Mother, I owe my life to thee. How shall I make thanks? Ten thousand blessings upon thy house, and— The house be unblessed. It is impossible to give exactly the old lady's word. Thank the gods as a priest, if thou wilt, but thank me, if thou carest, as a son. Heavens above, have I shifted thee, and lifted thee, and slapped, and twisted thy ten toes, to find texts flung at my head? Somewhere a mother must have borne thee to break her heart. What use thou to her, son? I had no mother, my mother, said Kim. She died, they tell me, when I was young. Hi, my! Then none can say I have robbed her of any right if, when thou takes the road again, and this house is but one of a thousand used for shelter and forgotten, after an easy flung blessing. No matter, I need no blessings, but, but— She stamped her foot at the poor relation. Take up the trace to the house. What is the good of stale food in the room? O woman of ill omen! I ha have borne a son in my time, too, but he died, whimpered the bowed sister figure behind the chudur. Thou knowst he died. I only waited for the order to take away the tray. It is I that am the woman of ill omen, cried the old lady penitently. We go down to the chatris, the big umbrellas above the burning ghats, where the priests take their last dues. Clutch hard at the bearers of the chattis, water jars, young folk, full of the pride of life, she meant, but the pun is clumsy. When one cannot dance in the festival, one must e'en look out of the window, and grandmothering takes all a woman's time. Thy master gives me all the charms I now desire for my daughter's eldest. By reason, is it? that he is wholly free from sin. The Hakim is brought very low these days. He goes about poisoning my servants for lack of their betters. What Hakim, mother? That very Dakar man who gave me the pill which rent me in three places. He cast up like a strayed camel a week ago, vowing that he and thou had been blood brothers together up Kulu way and feigning great anxiety for thy health. He was very thin and hungry, so I gave orders to have him stuffed to him and his anxiety. I would see him if he is here. He eats five times a day, and lances boils for my hinds to save himself from an apoplexy. He is so full of anxiety for thy health, that he sticks to the cook-house door and stays himself with scraps. He will keep. We shall never get rid of him. Send him here, mother. The twinkle returned to Kim's eye for a flash. And I will try. I'll send him, but to chase him off is an ill turn. At least he had the sense to fish the Holy One out of the brook. Thus, as the Holy One did not say, acquiring merit. He is a very wise, Hakim. Send him, mother. Priest, praising priest, a miracle. If he is any friend of thine, ye squabbled at your last meeting, I'll hail him here with horse ropes and, and give him a cast dinner afterwards, my son. Get up and see the world. This lying abed is the mother of seventy devils. My son, my son. She trotted forth to raise a typhoon off the cock-house, and almost on her shadow rolled in the babu, 
robed as to the shoulders like a Roman emperor, jowled like Titus, bare-headed with new patent leather shoes, in highest condition of fat, exuding joy and salutations. "'By Jove, Mr. O'Hara, I am jolly glad to see you. I will kindly shut the door. It is a pity you are sick. Are you very sick?' "'The papers, the papers from the kilter, the maps, and the Muralsa. He held out the key impatiently, for the present need on his soul was to get rid of the loot. "'You are quite right. That is correct departmental view to take. Have you got everything?' "'All that was handwritten in the kilter I took. The rest I threw down the hill.' He could hear the keys grate in the lock, the sticky pull of the slow-rending oilskin, and a quick stuffing of papers. He had been annoyed out of all reason by the knowledge that they lay below him through the sick idle days, a burden incommunicable. For that reason the blood tingled through his body when Hurry, skipping elephantinely, shook hands again. "'This is fine! This is finest, Mr. O'Hara! You have, ha ha, swiped the whole bag of tricks, locks, stocks, and barrels! They told me it was eight months' work, all gone up the spouts. By Jove, how they beat me! Look, here is a letter from the Hillas. He intoned a line or two of court Persian, which is the language of authorised and unauthorised diplomacy. Mr. Raja Sahib has just about put his foot in the holes. He will have to explain officially how the deuce and all he is writing love letters to the Tsar and they are very clever maps and there is three or four prime ministers of these parts implicated by the correspondence by gar sir the british government will change the succession in hillas and buna and nominate new heirs to the throne treason most base do you not understand eh are they in my hands said kim it was all he cared for just you jolly well bet yourself they are he stowed the entire trove about his body, as only Orientals can. "'They are going up to the office, too. The old lady thinks I am a permanent fixture here, but I shall go away with thee straight off immediately. Mr. Logan will be proud man. You are officially subordinate to me, but I shall embody your name in my verbal report. It is a pity we are not allowed written reports.' We Bengalis excel in the exact science. He tossed back the key and showed the box empty. Good. That is good. I was very tired. My Holy One was sick, too. And did he fall into— Oh, yes. I am his good friend, I tell you. He was behaving very strange when I came down after you, and I thought perhaps he might have the papers. I followed him on his medications and to discuss ethnological points also. You see, I am very small person here nowadays, in comparison with all his charms. By Jove, O'Hara, do you know he is afflicted with infirmity of fits? Yes, I tell you. Cataleptic, too, if not also epileptic. I found him in such a state under a tree in articulo mortem, and he jumped up and walked into a brook and he was nearly drowned, but for me I pulled him out. "'Because I was not there,' said Kim. "'He might have died.' "'Yes, he might have died, but he is dry now, and asserts he has undergone transformation.' The Babu tapped his forehead knowingly. "'I took notes of his statement for Royal Society in Posse. You must make haste and be quite well, and come back to Simla, and I will tell you all my tail at Lurgan's. It was splendid. The bottoms of their trousers were quite torn, and old Nathan Raja, he thought they were European soldiers deserting. Oh, the Russians! How long were they with thee? One was a Frenchman. Oh, days and days. Now all the hill people believe all Russians are beggars, by Jove. They had not one damned thing that I did not get them. And I told the common people, oh, uh, such tales and anecdotes. I will tell you at all Lurgan's when you come up. We will have a night out. It is a feather in both our caps, yes, and they gave me certificate. That is creaming joke. 
You should have seen them at the Alliance Bank identifying themselves. And thank Almighty God you got their papers so well. You did not laugh very much, but you shall laugh when you are well. Now I will go straightway to the railway and get out. You shall have all sorts of credits for your game. When do you come along? We are very proud of you, though you gave us great frights, and especially Mahbub. Ay, Mahbub, and where is he? Selling horses in this vicinity, of course. Here? Why? Speak slowly. There is a thickness in my head still. The Babu looked shyly down his nose. Well, you see, I am a fearful man, and I do not like responsibility. You were sick, you see, and I did not know where deuce and all the papers were, and if so, how many? So, when I had come down here, I slipped in private wire to Mahbub. He was at Meerut for races, and I tell him how case stands. He comes up with his men, and he consorts with the Lama. And then he calls me a fool, and is very rude. But wherefore? Wherefore? That is what I ask. I only suggest that if anyone steals the papers, I should like some good, strong, brave men to rob them back again. You see, they are vitally important, and Mahbub Ali, he did not know where you were. Mahbub Ali to rob the Saiba's house? Thou art mad, Babu, said Kim with indignation. I wanted the papers. Suppose she had stole them. It was only practical suggestion, I think. You are not pleased, eh? A native proverb, unquotable, showed the blackness of Kim's disapproval. Well, Hari shrugged his shoulders. There is no accounting for the taste. Mahbub was angry, too. He has sold horses all about here, and he says old lady is pucker, thorough, old lady, and would not condescend to do such ungentlemanly things. I do not care. I have got the papers, and I was very glad of moral support from Mahbub. I tell you, I am fearful man, but somehow or other, the more fearful I am, the more damn tight places I get into. So I was glad you came with me to Chini, and I am glad Mahbub was close by. The old lady, she is sometimes very rude to me and my beautiful pills. Allah be merciful, said Kim on his elbow, rejoicing. What a beast of wonder is a Babu! And that man walked alone, if he did walk, with robbed and angry foreigners. Oh, that was nothing after they had done beating me. But if I lost the papers, it was pretty jolly serious. Mahbub, he nearly beat me too, and he went and consorted with the Lama no end. I shall stick to ethnological investigations henceforward. Now, good-bye, Mr. O'Hara. I can catch 4.25 p.m. to Ambala if I am quick. It will be good times when we all tell the tale up at Mr. Lorgan's. I shall report you officially better. Good-bye, my dear fellow. And when next you are under the emotions, please do not use the Mohammedan terms with the Tibetan dress. He shook hands twice, a babu to his boot heels, and opened the door. With the fall of the sunlight upon his still triumphant face, he returned to the humble Dakar quack. He robbed them, thought Kim, forgetting his own share in the game. He tricked them. He lied to them like a Bengali. They gave him a chit. A testimonial. He makes them a mock at the risk of his life. I would never have gone down to them after the pistol shots. And then he says he is a fearful man. And he is a fearful man. I must get into the world again. At first his legs bent like bad pipe stems, and the flood and rush of the sunlit air dazzled him. He squatted by the white wall, and the mind rummaging among the incidents of the long Dooley journey, the Lama's weakness, and, now that the stimulus of talk was removed, his own self-pity, of which, like the sick, he had a great store. The unnerved brain edged away from all the outside, as a raw horse, once roweled, sidles from the spur. It was enough, amply enough, that the spoil of the kilter was away, off his hands, out of his possession. He tried to think of the lama, to wonder why he had stumbled into a brook. 
but the bigness of the world seen between the forecourt gates swept linked thought aside. Then he looked upon the trees and the broad fields with the thatch huts hidden among the crops, looked with strange eyes unable to take up the size and proportion and use of things, stared for a still half-hour. All that while he felt, though he could not put it into words, that his soul was out of gear with its surroundings, a cogwheel unconnected with any machinery, just like the idle cogwheel of a cheap Bahia sugar-crusher laid by in a corner. The breezes fanned over him, the parrots shrieked at him, the noises of the populated house behind, squabbles, orders and reproofs, hit on dead ears. "'I am Kim, I am Kim, and what is Kim?' His soul repeated it again and again. He did not want to cry, had never felt less like crying in his life, but of a sudden easy, stupid tears trickled down his nose, and with an almost audible click he felt the wheels of his being lock up anew on the world without. Things that rode meaningless on the eyeball an instant before slid into proper proportion. Roads were meant to be walked upon, houses to be lived in, cattle to be driven, fields to be tilled, and men and women to be talked to. They were all real and true, solidly planted upon the feet, perfectly comprehensible, clay of his clay, never more nor less. He shook himself like a dog with a flea in its ear, and rambled out of the gate. Said the Saiba, to whom watchful eyes reported this move, "'Let him go. I have done my share. Mother Earth must do the rest.' When the Holy One comes back from meditation, tell him." There stood an empty bullock-cart on a little knoll, half a mile away with a young banyan-tree behind, a lookout, as it were, above some new ploughed levels, and his eyelids, bathed in soft air, grew heavy as he neared it. The ground was good, clean dust. No new herbage that, living, is halfway to death already, but the hopeful dust that holds the seeds of all life. He felt it between his toes, patted it with his palms, and joint by joint, sighing luxuriously, laid him down full length in the shadow of the wooden pinned cart. And Mother Earth was as faithful as the Saiba. She breathed through him to restore the poise he had lost lying so long in a cot cut off from her good currents. His head lay powerless upon her breast, and his opened hands surrendered to her strength. The many-rooted tree above him, and even the dead man-handled wood beside, knew what he sought, as he himself did not know. Hour upon hour he lay deeper than sleep. Towards evening, when the dust of returning kine made all the horizon smoke, came the Lama and Mahbub Ali both afoot, walking cautiously, for the house had told them where he had gone. "'Allah! What a fool's trick to play in open country!' muttered the horse-dealer. "'He could be shot a hundred times, but this is not the border.' "'And,' said the lama, repeating a many times told tale, "'never was such a chela, temperate, kindly wise of ungrudging disposition a merry heart upon the road never forgetting learned truthful courteous great is his reward i know the boy as i have said and he was all of those things some of them but i have not yet found a red hat's charm for making him overly truthful he has certainly been well nursed. The Saiba is a heart of gold, said the Lama earnestly. She looks upon him as her son. Hm! Half Hind seems that way disposed. I only wish to see the boy had come to no harm and was a free agent. As thou knowst, he and I were old friends in the first days of your pilgrimage together. That is a bond between us. 
The lama sat down. We are at the end of the pilgrimage. No thanks to thee, thine was not cut off from good and all a week back. I heard what the Saiba said to thee when we bore thee up on the cot. Mahbub laughed and tugged his newly dyed beard. I was meditating upon other matters that tied. It was the Hakim from Dhaka broke my meditation. Otherwise, uh, this was in Pushtu for decency's sake, thou wouldst have ended thy meditations upon the sultry side of hell, being an unbeliever and an idolater for all thy child's simplicity. But now, red hat, what is to be done? This very night. The words came slowly, vibrating with triumph. This very night he will be as free as I am, from all taint of sin assured as I, when he quits this body of freedom from the wheel of things. I have a sign. He laid his hand above the torn chart in his bosom. That my time is short. But I shall have safeguarded him throughout the years. Remember, I have reached knowledge, as I told thee only three nights back. It must be true, as the Tira priest said when I stole his cousin's wife, that I am a Sufi, a free thinker. For here I sit, said Mahbub to himself, drinking in blasphemy unthinkable. I remember the tale. On that, then, he goes to Janatullah Aden, the gardens of Eden. But how? Wilt thou slay him or drown him in that wonderful river from which the Babu dragged thee? I was dragged from no river, said the lama simply. Thou hast forgotten what befell. I found it by knowledge. Oh, I true stammered Mahbub, divided between high indignation and enormous mirth. I had forgotten the exact turn of what happened. Thou didst find it knowingly. And to say that I would take life is not a sin, but a madness simple. My chela aided me to the river. It is his right to be cleansed from sin with me. Ay, he needs cleansing, but afterwards, old man, afterwards. What matter under all the heavens? He is sure of Nibban, enlightened as I am. Well said. I had a fear he might mount Mohammed's horse and fly away. Nay, he must go forth as our teacher. Aha, oh, now I see. That is the right gate for the colt. Certainly he must go forth as a teacher. He is somewhat urgently needed as a scribe by the state, for instance. To that end, he was prepared. I acquired merit in that I gave arms for his sake. A good deed does not die. He aided me in my search. I aided him in his. Just is the wheel, O oh horse-seller from the north. Let him be a teacher. Let him be a scribe. What matter? He will have attained freedom at the end. The rest is illusion. What matter? When I must have him with me beyond bark in six months, I came up with ten lame horses and three strong-backed men, thanks to that chicken of a babu, to break a sick boy by force out of an old trot's house. It seems that I stand by while our young Sahib is hoisted into Allah knows what of an idolater's heaven by means of an old red hat and I am reckoned of something of a player of the game myself. But the madman is fond of the boy, and I must be very reasonably mad too. What is the prayer? said the lama, as the rough pushed to rumbled into the red beard. 
No matter at all. But now I understand that the boy, sure of paradise, can yet enter government service. My mind is easier. I must get to my horses. It grows dark. Do not wake him. I have no wish to hear him call thee master. But he is my disciple. What else? He has told me. Mahbub choked down his touch of spleen and rose laughing. I am not altogether of thy faith, Red Hat, if so small a matter concerns thee. It is nothing, said the lama. I thought not. Therefore it will not move thee, sinless, new washed, and three parts drowned to boot, when I call thee a good man, a very good man. We have talked together some four or five evenings now, and for all I am a horse-copper, I still, as the saying is, see holiness beyond the legs of a horse. Yea, can see, too, how our friend of all the world put his hand in thine at the first. Use him well, and suffer him to return to the world as a teacher, when thou hast bathed his legs, if that is the proper medicine for the colt. Why not follow the way thyself, and so accompany the boy? Mahbub stared stupefied at the magnificent insolence of the demand, which, across the border, he would have paid with more than a blow. Then the humour of it touched his worldly soul. Softly, softly, one foot at a time, as the lame gelding went over the umbala jumps. I may come to paradise later. I have workings that way, great motions, and I owe them to thy simplicity. Thou hast never lied? What need? Oh, Allah, hear him! What need in thy world? Nor ever harmed a man? Once with a pen-case, before I was wise. So I think the better of thee. Thy teachings are good. Thou hast turned one man I know from the path of strife. He laughed immensely. He came here open-minded to commit a dacoity. A house robbery with violence. Yes, to cut, rob, kill, and carry off what he desired. A great foolishness. Oh, a black shame, too. So he thought, after he had seen thee, and a few others, male and female, so he abandoned it, and now he goes to beat a big fat babu man. I do not understand. Allah forbid it. Some men are strong in knowledge, Red Hat. Thy strength is stronger still. Keep it. I think thou wilt. If the boy be not a good servant, pull his ears off. With a hitch of his broad Bokhariat belt, the Pathan swaggered off into the gloaming, and the lama came down from his clouds so far as to look at the broad back. That parson lacks courtesy, and is deceived by the shadow of appearances. But he spoke well of my chela, who now enters upon his reward. Let me make the prayer. Wake, O oh, fortunate above all born of women, wake, it is found. Kim came up from those deep wells, and the lama attended his yawning pleasure, duly snapping fingers to head off evil spirits. I have slept a hundred years. Where? Holy One, hast thou been here long? I went out to look for thee, but— He laughed drowsily. I slept by the way. I am all well now. Hast thou eaten? Let us go to the house. It is many days since I tended thee. And the Saiba fed thee well? Who shampooed thy legs? And what of the weaknesses, the belly and the neck, and the beating in the ears? Gone! All gone! Dost thou not know? I know nothing, but that I have not seen in the monkey's age. Know what? Strange the knowledge did not reach out to thee when all my thoughts were the word. I cannot see the face, but
but the voice is like a gong. Has the sabre made a young man of thee by her cookery? He peered at the cross-legged figure, outlined jet-black against the lemon-coloured drift of light. So does the stone Bodhisat sit, who looks down upon the patent self-registering turnstiles of the Lahore Museum. The lama held his peace. Except for the click of the rosary and a flate clop-clop of Mahbub's retreating feet, the soft smoky silence of evening in India wrapped them close. "'Hear me! I bring news!' "'But let us—' out shot the long yellow hand, compelling silence. Kim tucked his feet under his robe-edge obediently. "'Hear me! I bring news! The search is finished! Comes now the reward! Thus, when we were among the hills, I lived on thy strength till the young branch bowed and nigh broke. When we came out of the hills, I was troubled for thee and for other matters which I held in my heart. The boat of my soul lacked direction. I could not see into the cause of things. So I gave thee over to the virtuous woman altogether. I took no food. I drank no water. Still, I saw not the way. They pressed food upon me and cried at my shut door. So I removed myself to a hollow under a tree. I took no food. I took no water. I sat in meditation two days and two nights, abstracting my mind in breathing and out breathing in the required manner. Upon the second night so great was my reward, the wise soul loosed itself from the silly body and went free. This I have never before attained, though I have stood on the threshold of it. Consider, for it is a marvel. A marvel, indeed. Two days and two nights without food. Where was the Saiba? said Kim under his breath. Yea, my soul went free, and wheeling like an eagle, saw indeed that there was no Deshu Lama, nor any other soul. As a drop draws to water, so my soul drew near to the great soul which is beyond all things. At that point, exalted in contemplation, I saw all Hind from Ceylon in the sea to the hills, and my own painted rocks at Sutsen. I saw every camp and village to the least where we have ever rested. I saw them at one time and in one place for they were within the soul. By this I knew the soul had passed beyond the illusion of time and space and of things. By this I knew that I was free. I saw thee lying in thy cot, and I saw thee falling downhill under the idolater. At one time, in one place, in my soul, which, as I say, had touched the great soul. Also, I saw the stupid body of Teshu Lama lying down, and the Hakim from Dhaka kneel beside, shouting in its ear. Then my soul was all alone, and I saw nothing, for I was all things, having reached the great soul, and I meditated a thousand thousand years passionless, well aware of the causes of all things. Then a voice cried, what shall come to the boy if thou art dead? And I was shaken back and forth in myself with pity for thee, and I said, 
I will return to my chela, lest he miss the way. Upon this my soul, which is the soul of Teshulama, withdrew itself from the great soul with strivings and yearnings and retchings, and agonies not to be told, as the egg from the fish, as the fish from the water, as the water from the cloud, as the cloud from the thick air, so poured forth, so leaped out, so drew away, so fumed up the soul of Teshu Lama from the great soul. Then a voice cried, The river, take heed to the river, and I looked down upon all the world which was as I had seen it before, in one time, in one place, and I saw plainly the river of the arrow at my feet. At that hour my soul was hampered by some evil or other, whereof I was not wholly cleansed, and it lay upon my arms and coiled round my waist. But I put it aside, and I cast forth as an eagle in my flight for the very place of the river. I pushed aside world upon world for thy sake. I saw the river below me, the river of the arrow, and descending the waters of it closed over me, and behold, I was again in the body of Teshu Lama, but free from sin, and the Hakim from Dhaka bore up my head in the waters of the river. It is here, it is behind the mango tope here, even here. Allah Karim, O oh, well that the Babu was by, wast thou very wet? Why should I recall? God, I remember the Hakim was concerned for the body of Teshu Lama. He hailed it out of the holy water in his hands, and there came afterwards thy horse seller from the north with a cot and men, and they put the body on the cot and bore it up to the Saiba's house. What said the Saiba? I was meditating in that body and did not hear. So thus the search is ended. For the merit I have acquired, the river of the arrow is here. It broke forth at our feet, as I have said. I have found it. Son of my soul, I have wrenched my soul back from the threshold of freedom to free thee from all sin, as I am free and sinless. Just is the will. Certain is our deliverance. Come. He crossed his hands on his lap and smiled, as a man may who has won salvation for himself and his beloved. End of chapter 15 and End of Kim by Rudyard Kipling